Welcome and thanks for joining us today as we once again celebrate the AAPI community in communications. I'm Shelley Spector, founder and director of the Museum of Public Relations here in New York. We've come together today to honor the extraordinary contributions made by today's AAPI leaders and also to pay tribute to a few of the many AAPI communicators of the past. Tonight, we're honored to be joined by MSNBC anchor Richard Louis in a fascinating pre recorded fireside chat with Dr. Baylin Shaw. After that, Bill Amata will moderate panels of professionals and students. They'll be discussing a wide range of current topics, such as the role of communicators in making our community safer and our role in making our workplaces more equitable. Last but not least, Patrice Tanaka will be wrapping it all up tonight, giving us plenty of things to think about as we close up the session. But first, I'd like to say a special thank you to all the sponsors who made tonight possible. The Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Georgia. John Awada, Renew PR, Page, TV One, Pat Ford, IW Group, IQ360, Diversity Action Alliance, Kit Stinton and Richard Muldoon, Davis and Gilbert, Mockrack, and Compro. Now, before we begin the show, I'd like us to recognize the contributions of generations of AAPI communicators who came before us as far back as the 1920s. This is a hidden history of PR that's never been covered in the PR textbooks, but certainly should, especially given the many obstacles these men and women had to overcome to make the contributions they made to both society and the profession itself. You can learn more about these and other pioneers on our website, prmuseum.org. But meantime, please meet Grace Lee Boggs, a Chinese American writer who used her skills to fight for social justice for more than 70 years. In that time, she wrote six very, very important books about socialism, revolution, and political philosophy. C.T. Hugh, a Malaysian PR professional and likely the first Asian to lead the Asia-Pac region for global PR agencies. In fact, in his obits, he was widely recognized for elevating the prominence of PR throughout Asia. Yuri Kokiyama, a Japanese American who emerged from the internment camps of the 1940s to become a civil rights organizer, a writer, and later a close advisor to Malcolm X. And there are many, many more AAPI communications pioneers that we can discover. Please follow our social channels where we'll be telling their stories throughout AAPI Heritage Month. Now I'd like to turn the mic over to our Masters of Ceremony, Bill Amata, a true PR pioneer himself. Bill? Thank you so much, Shelley Spector, and thank you to the Museum of PR and to all of our sponsors today. I wanna to wish everyone a very happy Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And as Shelley was talking earlier, we also wanna recognize a pioneer in our community who just passed away today. And that was Secretary Normanetta, who once served as a US Congressman. He later on served two different administrations, both a Republican and a Democratic administration and became US Secretary of Transportation. And at age 90, he passed away today after a distinguished career in public service. So uh, we wanna recognize him today. Hey, we're gonna start off with a very compelling conversation with Richard Louie, who's a news anchor, a civil rights activist, an author who is really a great part of the discussion around Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and how we have to uplift our voices. And he is being interviewed by a very distinguished scholar, Dr. Baylin Shaw, the chair of the Communication Studies Department at California State University, Fullerton in Orange County. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Richard Louie and Baylin. Please enjoy this conversation. And to the people in the audience, please take notes. Please think about some questions and please feel free to post them 
in that chat box. Also wanted to mention we have two panels. We're going to be focusing on a panel that will talk about the impact that Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders have had in our industry. And the next panel is going to be um, focused on how we elevate our voices, our stories, our narratives, and our histories uh, in the public relations and communication space. And that'll be followed up with a thoughtful conversation from students studying public relations and communications throughout the country. So we're gonna turn over the floor to Baylin Shaw and Richard Louie. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Baylin Shaw from California State University, Fullerton. And it's my honor this evening to be here with Richard Louie. How are you doing today, Richard? It's great to see you, Baylin. Great. So Richard, we have so much to talk about, and I'm just going to try to be quick while being thorough. You <laughs> have been an MSNBC Dayside anchor since September 2010. And before that, you spent five years at CNN Worldwide, including CNN Headline News as the solo anchor of the 10 a.m. hour of Morning Express. So in that role, you were the first Asian American male to anchor a daily national news broadcast in the United States. So if we could start with talking a little bit about being the first, which is something that I personally have a lot of conflicting feelings about. Um, how do you think uh, being the first Asian American male news anchor has impacted you or impacted other members of our community? You know, Ling, it was one of those things that um, my colleague, uh, Melissa Long, uh, when I told her, hey, by the way, I'm going to be moving on to uh, Anchor Orbit CNN Headline News, she said, well, Richard, you know. And I was like, no, I don't know. Uh, and she said, well, and I, I, you know, it was in the back of my mind, but certainly not in the in the forefront, of, not in the in front of my brain. And I... Um, I, I guess it, whatever, when you were talking about that, the first thing that comes to mind is why, you know, why in 2007, why do we have so few today? Um, I mean, I can probably count on uh, less than one hand, the number of folks that are Asian American male and, and anchoring uh, on a national level. Um, and that's a problem. I mean, what happened 15 years ago is still happening today. And so I'm not conflicted about the idea of it. I'm conflicted with the dynamics around it. When people think of representation in news media or any kind of media, often I think the first thing that comes to mind is representation that is visible, that is in front of the camera, that is on TV, that is in the show. Um, and what you're speaking to is a different kind of representation, which we are also lacking, which is representation in the halls of power, representation at the tables where decisions get made, right? Because if more people gave thought to the diversity pipeline and supply and demand at the higher levels where they could actually make a difference, maybe we'd see faster results. Uh, yes. Um... Look at the boardrooms. Yeah. Look at the CEOs that you're alluding, you're alluding to, to um, something I agree with. Um, not there. And um, look at those who are running all the major organizations and industries. Um, not there. Um, way underrepresented. Um, underpaid. Um, held back. It is through and through an issue. And yeah. You're absolutely right. I agree. Well, there are some organizations like Asian American Futures where members of our community who have resources or who have access to resources are working together. You know, Gold House is another example of pooling resources together to kind of leverage up members of the community. And I think it's organizations like that that really give me a lot of hope for the future, right? The most important um thing that's happening right now and over the last two years is um, a renaissance of the CBOs across the country that are looking at about the looking at and focusing on the intersectionality of our country and I so again I I'm heartened by the groups that 
you know, over the years that I've been able to meet. And you're right. It is uh, the CBO that if you're, if you're a Fortune 500, eh, if you're a Russell 2000 and you've got some money you want to invest into how do we fix this issue of inequity in any community, look at your CBO. Look at the, C- the community-based organization where you are at or where you want to be at. Volunteer. Join their boards. Donate. Donate, donate, donate. That's the real work. It's not, it's not just money. It's like getting – it's smart money. And the smart money model is what we need right now because it's about the relationships and the understandings of the gaps and in the, in, in what we understand to be the culture of one group and of America. So, yeah. I am heartened by the CBOs that uh, are popping up in every major city in the country. And we've had a lot since um, the Atlanta spa shootings. We've had a lot during the last two years of, of violence. And it is a renaissance. It is heartening. It is encouraging. And um, I, I, I just want to meet them all. Yeah. I, right? It's just they've done yeah. so much. In this... AAPI Heritage Month, you know, it's our opportunity to share our culture and it's also an opportunity for allies and accomplices to take extra time to learn about AAPI culture. So I'm wondering for people trying to better understand our culture during this Heritage Month, can you talk a little bit about that, about why it seems sometimes in our cultural background or heritage, there are things that happen that seem so important and yet we don't want to talk about them. Yeah, you know, not wanting to talk about these stories might be, uh, for for various reasons, Um, we are afraid. Um, We are humble, or not we as a group, but you might be, afraid you might be humble you might be scared uh, you may not have the tools all of these things are dynamic and i think existent in uh, our community just like many other communities um, the one thing on the flip side is do you celebrate in your community or in your family um, standing out do you celebrate speaking up for the truth do you celebrate um uh collegiality in that expression if you speak out do i support you bailing or do i go oh boy she's she's kind of you know talking a lot or well but uh, richard boy he loves to toot his horn a lot doesn't he um and i think it is I mean, I'm, I'm no sociologist, but I always try to answer the question the way that it's asked, best of my ability and my two cent opinion. You know, it is for the one, for those who did not have English a multi, a multiple generations before exposed to that immigrant group or to that origin country, it is more difficult. I mean, if you look at those from areas that, have not seen, and I'll bring up some that um, have not, I mean, uh, Cambodia, uh, Laos, uh, China, um, all, there's three examples of countries in Asia that didn't, Malaysia, who have not had a lot of exposure necessarily. Malaysia has more English exposure. If you look at India, you look at Korea, uh, you look at Japan, the Philippines who have had the unfortunate exposures sometimes to things as severe as colonialism, that the the benefit today is the assimilative arc has been um, heightened, peaked, right? Uh, Increased in steepness. And all of these things come back to why today, multi-generations in, why or why not would you not want to confront what fact is? And it, it is a lot of things baked in. I do believe that's part of it because if you look at the ability for our South Asian brothers and sisters to do so well in politics and media, which is definitely a raise the hand kind of industry, industries, 
um, they do well, I do believe, because of the difficult times before, right? Colonialism in South Asia was like, but on the flip side, you know, that assimilative process is a hundred years old and more. So there's a, there's a lot of deep answers to the question, why don't we stand up? Um, and why don't we value that stand-up quality if you were to make that a, an overall generalization? Um, I, I do know what you're talking about, though. So in our last two minutes, Richard, what suggestions would you give to our viewers about how to go about fulfilling that lifelong quest? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, you, you're, you're better equipped to answer that question. I would just say based on my experience of going through the book writing process and uh, my own caregiving and understanding why I would want to do it um, would be to spend a lot of time writing down who you are and where you come from, uh, what your name is and where the name came from, um, where your parents came from, why they made the decisions they did. Why did they decide to move there? Why did they choose that profession? Why decide to get married? Why decide to have you? Um, and writing it down has been so reflective uh, for me and so empowering. Um, I reflect back on, like I write about my grandfather, like why did he come here? Why did this guy do that? Um, it was a time where he had to come here illegally. It is a time where he bought the name Louis, that he's really a Wong. And, you know, it's because he wanted a better future for himself and for his kids and grandchildren and all of thereafter. And as you know, what I write is I, you know, I, I say, thank you, grandpa. Thank you. You know, your grandson became a news anchor nationally and you were a poor farmer from a little town in the south of China. And I would have been that too. He did not want me to be a poor Chinese farmer. And I, I say, I never met him, but thank you. I'm not a poor Chinese farmer. Let me close with this. You know, it's been said that we read to understand others and we write to better understand ourselves. And so for our audience, I would just say, read Richard's book so you can understand the heritage that so many members of our communities have, but also write your own book so that your story can be shared and that yes. future generations can thank you, just like Richard and I thank our ancestors for making the decisions that they made that enabled us to be here today to have this very privileged conversation. I can't thank you enough, Bailing. Thank you, Richard. I want to just say thank you uh, to Dr. Balin Shaw and to Richard Louis for that uh, great conversation. And I hope you learned something from that whole session. Um, what we're going to do now uh, is we're going to transition to the panel. But before I do that, I wanted to mention that Patrice Tanaka, who's been a long time advocate uh, in public relations and communications professional uh, in our community, who's also the founder of Joyful Planet uh, and the chief joy officer of that organization, is going to also help uh, curate some of the questions and end with some closing comments. Uh, as you heard from Richard and from Baylin Shaw, um, we still lack the representation in key roles, not only in corporate America, but within the media. And as you heard from Richard Louie, we have a lack of Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander men in senior anchor roles within the major networks. And although we made some progress, Richard was saying that he could still count on one hand the number of Asian American males that serve as anchors in our newsrooms. Uh, but also one of the things that Richard and Bailing talked about is that a lot of members in our community, although they are rich with wonderful stories and histories and lived experiences, they might be afraid or scared, or they may not have the tools to be able to elevate their stories to a wider public. 
And what is really important now, especially during Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and this rise in anti-Asian violence all across the country is that we need to tell our stories. We need to share them. We need to share our lived experiences and our histories and our narratives so that people will understand who we are. But we do suffer one, one challenge, which uh, Richard and Bailing mentioned, is two thirds of our population were born outside of the US. And because they were born outside of the US, they may not have the ability to speak a language uh, like English and be able to tell those stories. So as Balin mentioned, we could write those stories, we could read those stories, but ultimately we're a culture that has many, many generations of stories that we pass from one generation to another. It's now the time for us to broaden those conversations to others. So our very first panel that we're gonna talk about is going to be, did we as a community have an impact on the communications and PR industry? And to help me with that conversation are four seasoned professionals. We're going to start off and each of them are going to turn on their cameras one by one. And I'm not going to do it justice because we don't have a lot of time, uh, but hopefully you'll have a chance to meet them, not only here, uh, but sometime off camera uh, when you have an opportunity. For the first panelist, Sunmi Kim. She's a global diversity, equity, and inclusion leader at Omnicom PR. And she has more than 30 years of experience in public relations working for a variety of agencies, Ketchum, Socket PR, uh, Porter Novelli. And so her experience in the PR world is vast and we're really excited to have Sunmi Kim. John Anoda. John Anoda has worked in communications functions for a number of Fortune 500 companies, Charles Schwab, General Motors, Visa USA, and he served as a senior consultant to a number of public relations agencies, including Fleischman Hillard. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Liu is the senior vice president of the Pollock Agency. The Pollock Agency is a mid-sized agency out of Santa Monica, California. And she has something in her profile, which I found really fascinating. She says that she helps companies not only uh, with three Vs, their visibility, um, their value, uh, and so I'm hoping that you'll have a chance to chat with her. Uh, and lastly, uh, we have Cynthia Sugiyama, who's the Senior Vice President um, of, and Head of Communications for Diverse Segments, Representation and Inclusion at Wells Fargo. And she has years of experience working not only in the banking and finance industry, but also in retail, healthcare, and utilities. So this is our distinguished group of panelists. And I thought what I would do is is go a little bit off script and ask you what you thought of that conversation that we had uh, with uh, Dr. Shaw and Richard Louie. Any, any observing comments that you'd like to share with the group today? I will say for me, Bill, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I'm really honored to be a part of this conversation. Richard's comments made me both sad and joyful. Um, sad in the sense that so much of what he was describing um, in terms of representation, I think rings very true in our industry as well. Uh, but I was also heartened by the charge, the charge from both him and um, from Bei Ling of like, let's capture our stories, let's write our stories. So I was taking some really, um, a lot of notes there to make sure to collect their wisdom as well. Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting that Richard and Bailey talked about that we should write them and uh, we should uh, read those books. Um, um, but, you know, we're, our, our communities, the Asian American communities, the Native Hawaiian communities, and the Pacific Islander communities are all communities that have multiple stories. Uh, but one thing that I think Richard and uh, Bailey talked about was that we have some difficult histories histories of colonialism, histories of subjugation, histories uh, that you know, have impacted uh, our forefathers and, and, and mothers and grandmothers from being able to talk about some of their painful lived histories. Do you think that that has some impact on our ability to share those stories with others? I think so, I, I'm happy to chime in. I think um, those are very personal, right? Emotional. And to be able to share that, you have to have a certain level of vulnerability, which may come more easily to some and, and much harder to others. So, um, you know, like Sunmi, like, as you just said, Bill, I appreciated that final challenge to 
our community, the broader community, in terms of capturing our stories and narratives, because there is so much that others can gain and benefit from those. And in fact, sometimes in the capturing of those stories, as to pull that may be, we ourselves grow from that reflection too. I'll just chime in very quickly. So um, I'm a big fan of Richard Louis, and I'm one day hoping to tell him that my father's name is Richard Liu, <laughs> which is L-I-U. But, um, you know, his story really resonated with me, especially as well, um, you know, Many years ago, I was assigned as a student to, to do a family history project, and you can't imagine, it was so hard to pull stories out of my family members. And, you know, even for me, or for, you know, people, my contemporaries, I think we still struggle sometimes to ask, you know, and learn about our, our stories, and also to be able to tell them because partially out of a fear of them being too, you know, our stories are too Asian. Who'd be interested in that? Um, you know, it's not American or it's not part of like this sort of a, a shared narrative that everybody can understand. It's it's too different, it's too other. So um, like Soon Me, you know, I agree. His comments made me a little sad, but also, you know, I appreciated it at the same time. I appreciated the, the candor. You know, I, I'll just add that this conversation, both the tape recording and their comments, it reminds me a bit of, there's this PBS show called Finding Your Roots, um, mm -hmm. where they go through various generations. And it, you know it's all nationalities, all races. And that phenomenon of the first group coming over and not sharing the painful and traumatic events they went through, because the guests of the show are always flabbergasted to learn all these things that are just like one, two, or three generations away. So I don't, I think in some ways, you know, there's a universal immigrant experience and there's good or bad. Most societies reject immigrants. We're seeing it play out all around the world. And it's, it's a tough transition. And if you're really lucky, you end up like Richard and probably most of the people on this call where thank God for our grandparents or the people who made that journey because we would all be in probably worse circumstances than we are now. But I, I think we should also recognize like, this is a universal experience. This has been going on for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. And so we're, we are going to go through that transition. We're not gonna be able to snap our fingers and cure thing overnight because no one else has done that. Everyone's had to sort of go through this process and we're in it. So I, in my perspective, that's a good thing. Great. Um... Uh, I want to move to the questions because I think this is going to be a, uh, uh, we could have a, a pretty extensive conversation on this, but if you look at some of the statistics that you're seeing from the U.S. Census, from the Pew Foundation, from Nielsen and so many others, our population is the fastest growing population in the U.S. today. We've grown by double digits in 49 out of 50 states. Uh, we now represent more than 22, 23 million people. Uh, in less than 50 years, we're going to surpass the Latinx population in terms of the number of immigrants that are arriving on our shores. Um, have we made any significant progress in the public relations and communications industry? You already heard from Richard that we haven't made much progress on the media side. Uh, but from your vantage point, are you seeing any progress? And if you are seeing progress, where is that progress happening? Well, I'm happy to start us off. Um, I don't think it's any secret that our communities, and I say that plural, are vastly underrepresented in our industry. We are plagued by the same stereotypes, whether it be the perpetual foreigner, the model minority, the bamboo ceiling, that every other industry experiences um, in some way as well. Um, within, in our, within our industry, perhaps even more so, because there are those stereotypes that put us more in, let's say, STEM versus um, social sciences and the arts and um, communications. Um, there may be those stereotypes that we see play out that perhaps someone with a name like mine might not be one that's considered to even have a good grasp of the language. So without, let's say, anglicizing our names. So I think it's telling 
that for most of us um, from our communities, we know each other. Hi, John. Hi, Jackie, Cynthia, Bill. Um, and some Similarly, um, for example, when I was part of the PR We Call the Fame class, I knew every other woman of color um, in that same class as well. So we all knew, know each other because the universe is pretty small. Any other thoughts? Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we heard, uh, we're gonna be hearing from some students later on, but there's some really um, awkward statistics that are coming out that Gen Zers are actually going to be making a lot less money and will be in a more difficult position than the boomers were and the older Gen Xers. And so I think a lot of the students are kind of looking to us to not only help fix some of the problems that exist in the public relations and communications industry, but to do something about it quickly. Uh, and, and John, you mentioned that this takes some time. A lot of people go through this process and we all have to be patient as we go through this process. But we have a whole group of students that are coming in saying, hey, yeah, uh, boomers and Gen Xers, you've been around for a little while. Why haven't we made more progress? And what do we need to do as leaders in the communications and public relations industry to make sure that we advance more people that look like us um, in our agencies in corporate America? Any thoughts on that? Well, I can talk to it from a sort of anecdotal, uh, provide a perspective. So my corporate career ended 20 years ago, but um, I was in it for 20 years and, and since I've been consulting. And um, I was the senior Asian executive, I think at all the corporations I was at, I was part of the executive leadership teams. And so I've always mentored people, women, minorities, uh, throughout my career, and I still do. Um, there, there, were no, there were no Asian communicators to meet. I don't know that I met, uh, even saw a resume of an applicant for most of my career. So I understand we're in the circumstances now where there are a lot, but part of it is we, our Asian community didn't go into communications. They didn't go into marketing. Now they are, but it's it's not like some of these other groups, especially majority white groups, where they've been around for a hundred years in the, in this stuff. So our pipeline began. I don't know. The academics probably have a better sense of it, but my read would be like twenty years ago. We really started to get into it. So. Um, to be looking at the senior ranks, it takes about 20 years of career to get to the upper levels. And then you've got to show up and you know be talented and good and, and all those sort of things. So you need to sort of stand back and understand where our pipeline is and where the cohort is compared to the other cohorts and then compared to the mainstream. And we're kind of late to the party uh, and everyone is throwing elbows trying to get to the top at this time. So it's a scrum. Oh, that's a really good point, John. Uh, you know, uh, uh, being involved in the communications industry really has been relatively short lived for all of us, even though some of us have been around for 20, 30 years. Uh, that's considered a relatively short amount of time compared to some of the other communities. Um, uh, but one of the things that Richard said was that, you know, aside from being perhaps afraid and scared to tell our stories and to speak up and to raise our hand and, and demonstrate some value and support for people that do raise their hand. We may not have the tools uh, in order to progress in, in public relations and communications. Do you agree with that? And if you do agree with that, what type of tools do we need to make sure that um, generation, younger millennials and Gen Zs uh, and people that are still Gen Xers be able to progress in our industry? Uh, in some meaningful way. Yeah, because I, I have coached people, uh, you know, of, of all different races, and some of them have become heads of communications at major corporations or, or the heads of agencies. So I think I have a good read on what it takes to get to the top of an organization or an, or an agency. And like the number one attribute that will get you there the fastest is leadership because leadership is so incredibly rare. You can find workers, you can find managers, but it's really hard to find leaders. 
Um, and leader, and I, very few are born. So I believe leadership is a learned skill. Um, I was fortunate that people invested in, in my education and transformation leadership. I, I can tell you that the heads of all the corporations I've been associated with, I've traveled around with chairman and CEO, we, I could go with the head of General Motors, we could go to a plant and you're shaking hands, you're meeting maybe thousands of people a day. And on the flight back, the CEO would say, did you notice this person, the third person we shook hands with, they had it. Because it's so rare that all the heads of organizations are always looking for leadership. Um, so if I would encourage anyone, if, the, if there is a fast track, it's develop that quality. Mm, really, really good. Um, and Jackie, you know, you always say that you're, you're helping your companies uh, and clients with your three Vs, which is visibility, voice, and value. Um, how does that translate to a, a person that's trying to rise up to the ranks in public relations? Uh, you're also an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California, so you talk to students all the time and people that want to pursue uh, a career in our industry. Uh, how does those three v uh, values or three Vs translate to students and, and to people that are in the profession? Yeah, so I think I approach it um, the way I, I approach talking to students, you know, the way I approach talking to clients in many ways, which is to be candid and forthright with them. And, you know, and, and, and explain to them that identifying your, your voice and your vision and your values and all those things is a strategic process. And I can say that as well for our organization, Voices for AAPI as well. Um, it is very much a strategic long-term process. It's we're, we're still a work in progress and evolving. We're looking to differentiate ourselves from other organizations. And, you know, as to, as to what I say to my students, I am forthright with them and I'm very honest. And I, the conversation about money, for example, is starting to come up much more frequently. And I think we owe it to them to tell them, you know, how much people make at an entry level position and how, you know, how, what, how they can reasonably expect their careers to progress and whatnot. Um, you know, and as to working with, you know, other companies, it's very much the same process. So that's sort of a roundabout way of answering your question. But I think the, the basic takeaway here is that it's, it's a plan. You have to have a plan. So Cynthia, Sumi, and John, I mean, you've all worked in various companies. Uh, Sumi, you've worked at a variety of different agencies, Socket, Ketchum, Porto Novelli. Now you're at the top of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at Omnicom PR. Cynthia, you've worked in, in the utility companies. You've worked in healthcare. You've worked in retail. You've worked on the package goods side. John, you've worked you know, at General Motors and Visa. Um, I have to ask you this question. Um, would you have stayed at those companies um, if you had a different opportunity to work at those companies? Um, and what would have kept you at those companies? Uh, why did you leave? Um, so maybe that's kind of a roundabout way to ask you, that, did you always feel like you were supported in the companies that you were at? And what motivated you to leave? Was it money? Was it an opportunity? Or was it because you didn't feel supported? Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I am curious to know why you've moved from different um, different places, uh, because I think it'd be helpful to students and younger professionals that are in the audience, um, why people move and what motivates people to move. I'm happy to start with that. Um, so Bill, all the factors that you listed a moment ago um, could be any combination of the above um, as I move from one role to another. In some cases, again, embracing candor here, it could have been not having a great manager on having someone who was really there to champion me and my work. Um, in some cases, it was about seeing this new opportunity to grow, to challenge myself, to push myself outside of my comfort zone. Um, so in some cases, that was the big draw. Another big draw, frankly, was people at other companies who I knew who could attest to how well they were, they were functioning in their company, how much they loved the company, the culture, the values. That was a huge thing for me, that kind of personal connection to people who already worked there um, and who were really powerful recruiters just by virtue of the relationships we had. So 
you know, as I think back on my career, um, as you noted, been in a lot of different industries, it's really been any combination of those factors. But one thing I, I take away as I think about my career is that I'm really, really grateful that as challenging as some of these roles have been, I've always been able to find um, a leader or a mentor who really has been there to help look out, to be a mentor or a sponsor. And I think through voices, through discussions like these, we also hope to, to be that for, for some others as well. For me or John? Don't want to put you on the spot because that was a yeah. long question. I would love for John to go next because I've heard his story and I, I admire it. So, so John, would you mind going before me? No, I'd be happy to. So uh, I'm fortunate enough, uh, you know, at the, at the senior levels, um, recruiters are, are reaching out to you. So, you, you know, if, if you're a marketable sort of piece of talent, people will be trying to make money by selling you to someone else. So um, I took most of my jobs to develop myself professionally. I had a plan on how I would get to be the head of communications of a major corporation. And it entailed acquiring a whole set of professional skills and managerial skills and leadership skills and some perspective, including a global perspective and affiliation. I, I work with seven or eight global brands like McDonald's, where I was head of media relations and Levi's and Schwab, Harris Casinos, those sorts of things. So I made the move and I, I moved my family and everything like five or six times to different places. And it wasn't for the money. In fact, I was sort of go moving into more expensive housing markets and states with higher taxes. So now I'm in California where it can't get any worse in terms of taxes and, oh, and real kidding. estate um, because I wanted to invest in myself because my belief was that in our profession, you know, we are the product, essentially. It's our skills, our experience, our lived experiences, our perspectives. Again, if you have leadership, if you have consulting skills, <coughs> then we become marketable. And honestly, you know, I'd say this to everyone on this call, if, if, if you are really work on yourselves and you are a continuous learner, you're always trying to develop your value proposition. We are so lucky to be in a profession where we can go and work in any industry in almost any country in the world. If you wanted to do like hockey in some European country or hip hop music in Sri Lanka, if that job exists and you focus on it and get the right skills, network, experiences, backers, et cetera, et cetera, you can get there. I mean, and again, I've been around long enough where I've seen people say, I want to work in this industry or I want to be around movie stars or whatever. And son of gun, five, 10, 15 years later, there they are. They're doing what they wanted to do. So we're very fortunate. I mean, you know, other professions like dentists or doctors, like they're stuck in a practice. Once they have their clientele, they can't move. We have this great flexibility where our talent could take us anywhere. So I sort of use that to motivate and inspire me. And I guess to get back to your question, Bill, that meant I was going to keep moving. You know, I, I learned what I wanted to learn in about 18 to 24 months. I think a smart, hardworking person is going to get 80% of the value of any job they take in 18 months. Mm. And you can stay there the rest of your career and get maybe 10% more, or you could move on to a whole new experience and grow that 80% again in 18 months. Well, I did that six times. <laughs> so, so I think I made myself into a valuable proposition. So that's why I kept moving. I really like that, Cynthia and John. Great answers. I have to tell you, my brothers were pharmacists and they told me, don't be a pharmacist. You'll get stuck. There's only so far you can go as a pharmacist, but in communications, you can, the world is, your, is in your hands. So I, I agree with that. Sumi, did you want to add anything to that conversation? You know, as I was listening, I feel like if I had had somebody like John as my mentor, or just to even know of John earlier in my career, I may have made different choices. Um, and I think that just speaks to the importance of having people believe in you and know that um, what, what is possible. 
Um, I think in my case, um, I was ambitious for my life in um, a variety of ways. Certainly in career, I, I wanted to um, do a good job. I didn't want to shame my family. I knew I was, uh, <laughs> I was at least competent um, to, to do well by working hard and applying myself. And, but I also, it was important for me to think about my family, um, both my, my parents, but also um, my immediate family as a mother and as a, as, as a wife. And I know that those were decisions that I had also made for myself. Uh, more recently, um, specifically as I moved into more diversity, equity, and um, inclusion, um, the reasons and the ways that I make decisions for myself is all based on purpose alignment. And that's the way that I think about opportunities that come my way. And um, so that's not only about like one facet. So for example, um, money or position or anything like that, but I truly do think about what that platform is and what is the ability to use that as a resource for change. So um, I, yeah, I, yeah. So as I listen to all this, I love the stories. I love the opportunities there, um, but I also, it makes me really, really think about, um, you know, what is leadership? How is that defined by those in power? And um, just the just the influence that we all have uh, for those perhaps who aren't even, um, you know, that we aren't even aware are looking. Ooh, God, these are great answers. Um, I, I see a little note from Justin in the audience, which uh, intrigued me. So I wanted to just put this out here. He's asking uh, the panelists, if you could speak to how you overcome the fear of telling your stories and, uh, um, uh, I, I was involved in another conversation earlier and a, and a young woman raised her hand and said, everybody keeps telling me that I should raise my hand and speak up. Everyone tells me that I should insert my stories into conversation. Everyone tells me I should sit in front of the, uh, in front of the classroom or sit close to the chairman of the board in a meeting and amplify my story, but it is not in my DNA to do this. Um, if it is not in your DNA to be forthright about your stories, about your lived experiences. What advice do you have to people in the audience that uh, would love to share them, uh, but don't have a clue on how to do that and are fearful of doing it? Hey, Bill, so that question really spoke to me because it's something I actually went through last year. So I think so many of us who work in communications are used to being behind the scenes, developing the strategy, helping implement tactics, often ghostwriting for our senior executives, what have you. But last year, as I saw just the horrific events unfold around me in terms of attacks directed at the Asian American community, I just felt this, um, this incredible um, desire to begin to write what I was feeling. And I didn't know, as I was writing it, it became in my own op-ed, um, where I described my own experience with being targeted as a young child and how that was an inflection point then. And fast forward many years later to this point now where it was yet another inflection point. And while I didn't have a voice then, I was seven or eight and stunned into silence when I was being bullied. Here I was a professional communicator who could finally use my voice. So putting that out there in an op-ed mm -hmm. in the Chronicle was very unnerving initially, but the outpouring I got made me realize that we actually each have a voice beyond our professional kind of hat that we wear, that we have our own stories that we can share. And even more surprising, just very quickly, was that people who then reached out to me who said, I'm now going to write my own story and who went out and got their pieces published because of my little piece made me, again, realize that um, sometimes it just takes hearing somebody else and share their story that can give you just, just enough to write your own. Mm -hmm. I would second that, Cynthia. I think writing can be so cathartic. I think therapy can be is, is really helpful for some people. But I think that people have to be comfortable in sharing their stories in their own ways, even if it's just taking a baby step, even if it's retweeting something that they agree with and align with, even if it's starting a personal blog and have nobody reads it except like your family members, right? But it's doing it in your own way in a way that you can, you know, that you feel good about and feel comfortable with. So small steps, you know, lead to greater confidence and overcoming shame and overcoming, you know, different roadblocks and barriers. And eventually, 
you know, with confidence, with experience and with maturity, hopefully that grows and you do feel comfortable, you know, more comfortable eventually speaking up in a meeting, right? Or speaking up and sharing your story in a more public setting. But I think it's okay to honor, you know, that maybe you're not okay with it right now. So if I could, I'd love to just perhaps even reframe, because I think sometimes yeah, we do. think we think we have to adopt um, the certain ways of the world, um, and it feels very foreign to us. So I'll tell you, for me, I am not the kind of person that's going to put my elbow to your throat. I am not the, the person who feels good about just speaking to speak um, and doing the right things just because to get ahead. Um, I might still do those things because I want to get ahead or I want to get to know a person. I've tried to think about things more transformationally than transactionally. But I think a key for me of wanting to tell perhaps my story is because is when I remove myself. So for me, um, as I was growing up, I was I was raised to be resilient. I was raised to like, if somebody does something against me, like get over it, um, you know, be tough and 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 endure. There's a Korean word that means um, is chama, which is, is kind of about forbearance and like kind of take it and like grin and bear it. And I finally came to a point for me, I'm like, I'm not gonna chama anymore because even if I can bear it, even if I can tolerate all of this, guess what? The people that are coming behind me should not have to endure because I didn't speak up. My children should not have to endure because I did not speak up. So I don't want these same problems to be um, be something that we have to confront because I didn't do what I needed to do because I was uncomfortable. So I try to take solace in reframing um, in a way that works for me. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, so I want to give you all the last word uh, in the next, uh, you know, 30 seconds or so. Can you talk about something that you believe um, we as communicators, uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders need to do to ensure that others that follow us uh, that are Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders uh, can do uh, to make sure that uh, we enable them to be successful in our industry. Is there something that we can be doing or you can be doing that will help others be successful in our industry? And that is uh, our last word before we wrap up. So. Um, I'll jump in. So this discussion of not speaking up and what have you, I mean, some of this is cultural, right? Like I, I've managed global functions and, you know, Dealing with the Australian group of communicators is very different than dealing with the Japanese group of communicators is very different than dealing with Indonesian, et cetera. A lot of us come from very low, low key cultures where a lot of the communications is context and whatever, but that's not the mainstream culture here. Um, so, you know, it's, and it's getting ridiculous. It's like a food fight, right, online and whatever. But the Asian community overall, not just the, com the um, communications professions need to be more visible and you know, just more active and articulate overall. A lot of them are not that articulate. So I don't know about the rest of you. I, my assumption is most of you have all spent time doing pro bono work or being part of nonprofits and going out and helping Asian nonprofits articulate their stories, develop at least one camera ready spokesperson who can get a little bit of airtime. That is our skills and it's very powerful. But one of the reasons our, our community is not top of mind is because they won't even get in front of the camera. They won't talk and they need help and coaching from people like us. So if everyone on this call went and found one group of dentists or farmers or whatever and help them tell their story, we would be more mainstream. Excellent point. Soon me, yeah, Jack, Bill, me, um, I'll just say that. So every year I come up with a word that is my theme for the year. And so one of my words is claim. That was a previous word. So claim yourself, claim who you are. You deserve to be here and to have your story told and shared. And, but my word for this year is the word power. And so I will also say claim your power. And so 
when I think about the word power, like who am I to desire power? But power for me, defined by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., power is the ability to achieve purpose and effect change. And because of that, I want lots of power. I want everybody on this panel to have lots of power. I want everybody listening to um, claim your power and use your power for good as well. So um, that would be my parting thought. Thank you. And my parting thoughts related, so I'll go ahead and tag on, um, which is not to accept the status quo. I think so often people feel as though, and I know it's a generalization, but we Asian Americans, we're doing just fine. <laughs> we're successful, we are progressing, all is well. But the reality is we all know too well the challenges that our community continues to face. And it can, it, you can become desensitized to when you feel as though things are good enough. The thing is, good enough isn't enough. And so I hope that we can continue to go for more, go for higher, strive harder, which is why I think Voices, the organization that so many of us are involved in, um, can hopefully play a role um, in helping people find their voice and use their voice. Thank you. Yeah. So one is, of course, if there are any uh, students here, please take my class. <laughs> But also, you know, my kind of parting words here are to just to, to continue to be generous, be generous with your time, of course, in mentoring and supporting and helping, you know, young people in the next generation, but be generous with, you know, your energy too, right? Like lead in leading by example and, you know, being excited and showing that it's cool to do these things. And it's okay to share your stories and talk and you're not being, you know, different or burdening anybody. So be generous. Wow. Thank you all for your time, panelists. I hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, we're going to wrap up this panel and we're going to go right into panel number two. So I just want to say thank you to Sunmi, Jackie, Cynthia, and John for their time. Uh, and uh, hope you'll stay in touch with all of them uh, because I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. So we're going to move on to a panel two. So thank you all. So uh, you've heard from these four amazing professionals. Uh, and I just love what they just said, you know, claim your power, be involved, like Richard Louis said, and John said, to support a community-based organization leader, or even an, another industry professional and advance them uh, so that they are able to elevate their stories, not to follow the status quo, to always look for better ways to challenge not only yourself, but our industry, and to be generous and, and always find ways to give to others and support others in their journey to succeed uh, in our profession. So thank you to all the panelists. Our next panelist is gonna actually dovetail very nicely with what we were talking about, tell, telling our stories, elevating the stories of others. And so uh, the panel that we're going to have next are three people, uh, Patricia Ratalangi, who is the VP and Global Communications Officer for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, she also works on corporate social responsibility for the Nielsen Company. Jennifer J. Piliani Requero, who's the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at AEG. And Roela Santos, who's at BAE Systems, and she's the Vice President of Communications uh, and Marketing at that organization. And uh, we're really excited to have all three of you. And, and I wanted to start off because uh, you heard the other four panelists, John, Cynthia, Jackie, and Sunmi talk a little bit about the need to be generous, the need to uplift CBOs and other leaders, the need to not follow the status quo, but to always challenge it. And the need to be more generous and claim power in the conversations that we have, not only with ourselves, but with others. So what did you think about that conversation and anything that uh, you took away from that conversation and the earlier one? I can start. Um, I thought it was great. They did an amazing job and no surprise, a lot of inspiring stories um, that we're taking to heart. So thank you so much for your generosity. And I think they definitely set that example just by sharing their stories. Um, and I would just echo one thing that I'm reminded of from hearing uh, from them and uh, I'm reminded of from one of my mentors myself, the idea of being unapologetic about who you are and your story um, and just being proud of it. And I think uh, as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, sometimes we 
we think about more of you know the the people before us, our ancestors, but also think that you're honoring the people before you and uh, the, their sacrifices by telling your own story. So just be unapologetic and be proud. And I think um, I just wanted to add a little bit to that too, Rala, fully fully on board with what you're saying, right? And I think as communicators, we are in that Cadbutt seat where we are helping to shape the stories that get told out there, whether it's for the companies, for our families, for the communities. I know if you go to church or temple or mosque or whatever it might be too, like you have the skill and the talent to be able to tell the stories in a meaningful way that's more authentic as well, because hey, we're the Asian people who are living these stories, so. Jay, do you have any thoughts? I'd just like to build on what Patricia and Rollo are saying. I think the one thing I would add is, you know, as I become an auntie in this work, like I feel like I'm becoming more of an elder than I was, uh, my advice to young people really is that being different is adding value, whether you're a communicator or you're in business, know that you should stand strong and know that your perspective being different will add value to the conversation and just be really clear about who you are as you're sharing your thoughts. Yeah, it's kind of like what Sumi said, you got to claim power. Uh, right. and, and so uh, I, I thought that was a really interesting conversation. But one of the things that I want to start off with is that uh, we talked a little bit about lived experience, and that's become more and more value and valuable in this conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusivity, and belonging. Um, and, and, and many of our communities, specifically the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, they, they talk story, they share these stories, and they pass them on from generation to generation. And I think the same is true for people that live in Indonesia and in Malaysia, people that live in the Philippines, is that we share those stories from generation to generation. So how do we bring those lived experiences to life in meaningful ways. We can definitely support CBOs, those community-based groups. We can definitely become educators like uh, Jackie is an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California. We can definitely move from company to company to demonstrate you know, the excellence that we have in all of our communities. But how do we share those lived experiences if you are just starting in your career? You're hearing about these stories, you're living these experiences. How do we share those in a different way? So for me personally, Bill, you know, I've been in different parts of corporate comms, um, but only became, you know, DNI communications about two years ago, right? Um, and the way I started to join in was through our business resource group. Um, and then when I first actually shared the story about um, what I went through as an Indonesian Chinese, that was when people said, oh, that's a really powerful story and you should tell it more. And um, it was hard to be honest, because I was like, do people really care about this? Um, and just to let you know a little bit, right, it was, um, I have an Indonesian study, although I'm ethnically Chinese, um, and it's because my father had to register himself with that Indonesian surname um, at that time, and when he first, when he was like first generation in Indonesia. <clears throat> so none of his siblings have the same surname, which is really weird, but, you know, it wasn't until I shared this with um, a black colleague of mine, she was like, girl, that's erasure. <laughs> I was like, you know, I didn't have the words to put that into context. And um, it's actually helped me find common ground and really make new friends across different Asian cultures, um, across, you know, the different communities, um, Black, Latino, and Native people that I've actually come across personally. So um, putting the story was a powerful way for me to connect. Very good, very good. Any other? Yeah, I, I would echo what Patricia said. I think there's so many interesting uniqueness that we bring to the table. Um, I think first step is being curious, right? Also drawing those, those stories out of people asking questions. Um, we always talk about how, unfortunately, Asian Americans are lumped together as if we're one culture, um, one history. And I think we can set that example by asking, especially the, the less represented groups or the smaller groups in our own communities, what their unique uh, stories are, what their perspectives are. Um, I'm you know, an, an immigrant, um, moved to this country as a teenager. And even that also brings a unique perspective that initially, you know, I was a little ashamed of, you know, I'm working to remove, take, take, 
um, just work on my my um, my accent and all of that stuff. But I, I've learned to embrace that because that's what makes me unique and what makes me stand out. So I'll just build on that as well. Um, I just did a presentation that was for leadership education for Asian Pacific Islanders. And so these are sort of up and coming leaders who fall under that big umbrella of AA and HPI. And I told them about my first job out of college where I worked at NBC as a page and that I never talked about being Asian because there was no one there to hear the story. And I didn't realize that was gonna be as impactful as it was because I was just you know, telling my story of being a 22 year old fresh out of college. And so I, I think about today when I do presentations on diversity, equity, and inclusion or business need, I always acknowledge the fact that I am a second generation Filipino American and where my family came from, because I think there's, very, there's a lot of power in that. And I tell their whole story, post-World War II, how, are they, how did they come here? It was because of the brain drain or the military pool. And I think even if you go to US history, you can sort of relate to some of that, whether it's the US perspective or the Asian perspective. And that's really opened up a lot of doors for me to have other conversations with peers and other leaders. Uh, I think it's great, and and, and you um, you uh, touched upon uh, you know some of the communities that are often neglected because you know the top six uh, communities uh, uh, in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities uh, represent eighty five percent of our U.S. population. But as you uh, have all alluded to, there are multiple um, ethnicities within our community. And and Richard kind of mentioned uh, the Kame, the Cambodian community, but uh, when you look at our community, sometimes the larger communities dominate and cast a shadow on some of the other communities that uh, you know may not have the same tools, uh, may not have the same level of equity that some of the other Asian American communities have, especially the more dominant cultures in our community. How do we elevate the stories of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, people from Cambodia, from Laos, uh, the Hmong, the Mien, the Thai, people from South Asia and elsewhere, how do we elevate their stories? So I'll start. Um, I serve on the Asia Pacific Islander American Health Forum, and we are very deliberate about talking about Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, as well as Asian Americans when it comes to health equity. And I think just as you said, Bill, you called out the names of these countries that fall under this big umbrella. Even saying that has power, right? I, I think that so often we go to sort of the main six countries that are under this umbrella and we think, forget about newer immigrants and how their issues are very different from a, com a, um, a family who's been here for six or seven generations. So we need to call it out. I think we also need to acknowledge that we have to learn ourselves within our own community, particularly about Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians and their issues so that we can amplify them in a way that is really honoring what their needs are if we're not able to provide their voice, if we're not able to bring somebody into the conversation, we need to make sure we're telling the right story on their behalf. So I would just say there's, that's one part of it. Oh, that's a really good point. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to chime in and, and, and do a little plug for our May 24th webinar that's going to focus on AHPI communications communicators and their experience. So stay tuned and uh, onto LinkedIn for that. Um, but one additional thing, and this is more from a business standpoint, right? Um, I'm from Nielsen. We do data about media, audiences, content, and so forth. One of the things that I shared today with um, our teams was that it's AANHPI. It's not just APAHM anymore, okay? Um, the government has declared it so. We should be leaning into that. And then we, we are actually starting to look at our data sets, you know, like, are we able to break it out? Um, and fortunately, yes, we do. We have one data set that's able to show content by different subgroups um, under the Asian um, uh, umbrella itself, and NHPI is one of them, which is like, that's great. But, you know, we made a commitment to look across the, the data taxonomies and so forth to make sure that we are being representative um, of the diversity within the diversity of the country, right, and the audiences that we represent. Mm. I'm glad uh, Voices is going to be doing something specifically around NHPI communities and the communicators that are really helping to lift up those communities, but as, as well as our own. So thank you for sharing that. But I know that Nielsen has created a lot of uh, data sets that will be interesting for people to, to see. So uh, please uh, contact uh, Pat afterwards to get those data sets. Um, 
there was a question earlier that was posed and I, I, I put it on the list of questions that, uh, that were often Asian Americans, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are often viewed as really good employees in the communication space, uh, but horrible managers. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Is, does this perception, do you believe still exist? And if it does exist, what do we need to do to eliminate that? Uh, because one thing that happened to one particular individual that worked at an agency, she worked 18 hours a day, five or six days a week. Uh, she could do the job of four different communicators within her company. She was passed up for promotion multiple times. When she found out why she was passed up for promotion, she was angry. You know why she was passed up for promotion? Her boss said, oh no, you can't take her. This woman does the work of five people. If you take her, I will need to hire three or four people to replace her. Please do not promote her. Um, she was viewed as a great worker, but they didn't look at her as an opportunity to be a good manager. So do you believe that some of this still persists? And if it does persist, how, what, how might we combat this? So it sounds like she's working for the wrong company or the wrong manager, my personal perspective. Uh, so that's an interesting statement, right? Poor managers, but better workers. And if you unpack that statement, it goes back to the stereotype of Asian Americans or you know, the certain people who are good in, and are worker bees, uh, good technical skills, but perhaps lacking leadership skills. Um, but guess what? Look around the Zoom room and you, it's filled with leaders who are breaking that stereotype. So I think as leaders, we do need to speak up and, and say that that might be uh, what people's default perspective is, but we have the opportunity to break that stereotype and prove them otherwise. Um, for people who are starting or just starting in their careers, I think it's important to understand that you do have to be specific in terms of asking what you want from your leaders and your managers and what you deserve. Um, and if they don't see that, um, I think there were discussions from the previous panel that said, you know, might, they might, might not be the right fit. They might not appreciate you. It's time to look uh, for another company that would appreciate you and develop you and see your potential. Very, very good. Um, what the, the question that I had earlier was actually answered by the other panel, um, uh, but, but this has come up multiple times with younger people. Uh, some of the students that you're gonna be hearing from later have actually indicated that, you know, when they go to these discussions, it doesn't matter if it's Asian Americans, it could be black Americans or Latinx Americans or LGBTQI folks. They always say, hey, stand up, raise your hand, speak up, be aggressive. Uh, ask for what you want. Um, and, and some of the students are pushing back and saying, yeah, some of it is culture for us. Uh, some of it is, uh, you know, we just don't have enough people that are going to support us. Uh, we don't have anybody there to pick us up when we fall. Uh, and so um, when you hear things like that, uh, and I think Jackie in the last panel kind of mentioned, sometimes you could just take baby steps, learn a little bit uh, and, and see how you progress. Um, but what else might they be able to do if, if, if it's a little bit more difficult for them to do that ask? Because I, I'm getting a lot of people, for instance, asking me for things, uh, but, but I have a hard time asking for something in return. And I think that's the problem that we have in our community sometimes is that when we're, we're, we're being evaluated as an employee, uh, employers will say, hey, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And you know, I always wanna be a great team player. So I always say yes. But then I'm always afraid to ask for something in return. And I think that that is not a good negotiation tactic for me. I should have always asked for something in return. If somebody asks you for something, then it's okay to ask for something in return. But I don't think it's that easy for some people. So aside from taking some small steps, do you have any other recommendations for people in the audience that may have that difficulty? So I'd love to start this question off with my response. Um, I think my parents were really clear with me, like if you put your head down, you work hard, you will be rewarded. 
And that does not translate to corporate America, right? You have to be able to advocate for yourself, um, brag a little bit. But I think what I learned was I needed to find folks who would be my mentors and sponsors in the workplace. And quite frankly, they were straight white men because they were the folks that were making decisions about how do you do promotions, who's got the skill set. And so I deliberately met folks who were straight white men in executive roles and you know, talked to them about my job and what my aspirations were one-on-one -on -one to begin with. And they started advocating on my behalf. So I think it's it, I think we as Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders do need to mentor people like us and, and all people of color. And at the same time, we can't forget that there are still decision makers at the top that may not look like us. And so I think um, reaching out to those folks who are in positions of power for some coaching, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I do have to ask you this question then, because I, I just saw a little note pop up about, you know, we need sponsors. Um, but in another conversation I was having earlier, somebody said, okay, yeah, we need sponsors, we need mentors. Now, how do you get a sponsor? I mean, I think that, that that perplexes a bunch of people saying we need a sponsor. So do we walk up to one of these executives and say, I want you to be my sponsor? Uh, or if you get passed up for these promotions over and over and over again, and you wonder why you get passed up for, for these promotions in public relations or communications, what should be the next step? First of all, how do you get a sponsor? And second of all, if you feel like you're not being heard, if you feel like you're not getting promoted, what do we need to do to make that happen? So I want to say, I want to build on, I think Su Ann Hong had posted a comment here that corporate culture has a lot to do with it. Um, and I think this goes back to what you said Royal, earlier, where you may not be in the right place. Um, and given the great resignation, now is the time to challenge and really look deep into corporate culture and see if once you're in, are you going to get the support, uh, the leaders, the people who will want to see you being successful, right? And see that as their own success as well. Um, I think that's really that's that's really the first step you need to do. Like really look, take a careful look at the corporate culture and if you whether that's still really a fit for you at this point in your life. Um, and I think secondly, um, in Chinese, there's this term Quan Si, which is really about building your personal networks and those relationships. And Bill, you mentioned this story about the, the person who says they keep asking me for things. I'm like, you don't have to ask them for something back right away. Write their name down. <laughs> <laughs> what one day when you do need something, go to go back and ask them, hey, Bill, you know, the other time, you know, we talked about this, right? Um, now I'm wondering if you know, or if you have this in exchange. I mean, for someone like me, you can't remember anything. That's what I have to do personally. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, this is something that I've seen a Hispanic leader in our organization do really, really well. I mean, she really does this really well. And um, it's not awkward or, you know, or unnatural at all, because, um, you know, it's, Again, you're, you're building a natural network and you continue to build those relationships, um, not, when, only, not only when you want something, you know, so, um, and I think that's a strength of us um, at, within our Asian culture as well, that, you know, we have these terms, you know, that's built right into our language, right, that's really about connecting and collaborating. Yeah, to add to that, that's a really good point about networking. I think um, it's also important to to put yourself out there, uh, attend these events, reach out, build those connections. Um, I've been asked that question a lot. How do you build sponsors? How do you find mentors? And I always compare it to actually dating because somebody might be perfect on paper, but when you meet them, there's no chemistry and it becomes more work to build that relationship. That's why I think you have to play the field and meet a lot of people. And you'll find people that you click with, they naturally want to champion you. They naturally find uh, you, the leader that they see in you. So, uh, so, so get out there, meet people. It, it, at the end of the day, even if you don't find that, that um, mentor right away, you're learning and you're expanding your network. Okay, I love right. that swipe left. I don't, I don't nod on that. Is that how we do that? <laughs> I say swipe up. Maybe that's, a, that's an app that needs to be created, <laughs> a mentor matching app. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's a nice way to end this conversation. But I, I do want to leave you with with one parting comment because we really didn't get to talk about the you know rise in anti Asian hate. But I think I want to end on a more positive note. Um, and this is off uh, a script here. Why are you proud to be uh, an Asian American or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander? And why do you believe we as a community need to express that pride that we have. I, I didn't have this on the pre-questions audience, so, uh, but I wanna know why we're proud to be Asian American, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders in this country and, and how can we express that pride, not only to others, but to encourage other people to feel that same way. I, I go back to my uh, introductory statement about honoring the people, your, the fam your family and the sacrifices they've made. Um, and I really do feel that by telling my story, I'm honoring all the things, all the decisions they made, um, the experiences they gave me and blessed me with. Um, so I'm very proud to tell my story because I feel like I represent my past and also open doors to the future. Thank you. I'd say my response is very similar to that. Um, my grandmother was widowed during World War II in the Philippines, and she actually was living in a very small province, but had an education and was a registered nurse. So she came to this country alone, widowed with four children who she actually left with her sister for, for, her, um, for them to care for, and earned enough money and saved up and brought her four children over. And so I feel a great responsibility to continue to be a leader like her and to continue to be brave. But also, you know, there's a, a phrase they often use um, in the black community, lift as we climb. And I think that we have a responsibility um, as women of color to do that same for our communities, to lift as we climb. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Both of you. Well, I, 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 love, I love that, um, Jane and Royal and both. Um, I think one of the things that makes me proud is just sitting on a panel like this. I mean, just watching the trailblazers. And I know I'm look, really looking forward to the students' conversation after this too, to see what their takeaways are. But um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think I've become more comfortable with in like, in terms of what do I do from here on out? What can I do um, to be a good person as a representative of the a and HPI community? I'm gonna borrow from John Lewis again, which is creating good trouble, right? And that's kind of like, okay, my Asian, my Asian upbringing, you know, I can hear my mother yelling, do not create trouble, right? But hey, mom, it's good trouble. So, and I think through creating good trouble by having these conversations, by challenging stereotypes, um, that's when you will make a difference. And that's when you can change things for the better for, you know, and really sh show up strong for the people who came before us and for those that are coming in front of us. Well, thank you so much all for your time uh, and for your wisdom. Um, I wanna just say thank you so much to Patricia, Roella and to Jay for uh, being with us tonight. Uh, we're gonna end this panel on, on, a, on a really positive note. And then we're gonna turn it over to the students. So I just wanna say thank you to all of these panelists uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next round. Uh, so we're gonna invite our students uh, who have been listening in very patiently and they're the next generation of corporate and agency and community-based leaders that are gonna be, you know, carrying on with the communications and the public relations field. So if you would all please join us for this panel. And, and Ian, I have to say, uh, Ian's one of the students from the University of Southern California. He said, hey, Bill, if you want, I could help lead this panel. And so I was very impressed that he kind of just stepped up and said, you know, we don't need to have the OGs run everything. We could also kind of run our own kind of conversation. So you are welcome to help jump in into this conversation and help. But before we do that, I want to introduce the people that are here. Uh, first and foremost, to my left is Verinda Argawal. She's a communications student, public relations student from Penn State University. She's also an international student. Uh, I also, uh, to below her on my screen is Zini Chen from the University of Florida. She's a communications student there in public relations. She's also with their agency. They have a, an on-campus agency, and they also have the very first Asian American Public Relations Student Association on their campus. 
Uh, and then next to her, I have Mia Cato from Kent State University, who's studying public relations there. I have Arya Pana, uh, Apalaganas from the University of Guam. Uh, she's not necessarily a communications student, but you know she's uh, in, involved in, I believe, business. Um, and so she's uh, joined us. And last but not least, uh, we have Ian Solano from the University of Southern California. So Ian, you're gonna help me with this conversation, but let me ask the first question. What did you think of the conversations you heard earlier? Any thoughts? Any observations, anything that you learned or anything that uh, you wish you'd learned? I particularly learned a bunch. Every time I go into these panels, I'm like, man, I am learning so much. And I also think that it gives me a perspective like of that my voice matters, right? Just hearing folks speak about their experiences, what they've learned and the careers that they've gone through really inspires me to just go and do my career and do a really good job and hopefully bring people up as well. Um, there's one thing in particular, uh, in particular that I wanted to mention. It was Soon-Mi Kim. Um, she mentioned that, you know, if I had a mentor like John, my experience would be different. Um, and that's why we need mentors. And I think reflecting back as a student of all the mentors that I've had, most of them are white people in, in the communications. And they have been super helpful, empathetic, but I think there are some cases where I would prefer them to be Asian, mainly because it really gets down to the very nuanced conversation, right? So like, let's say if my mentor were to say, Ian, you just have to advocate for yourself. And I would say, well, I don't really know how to do that. I grew up not you know, bragging about what I've done, all my accomplishments and stuff like that. I think there's just different nuances that an Asian person can bring to the conversation, um, such as, you know, just being Asian, uh, parental experiences or expectations, um, the community expectations, and also just like the representation in general. Um, but I don't want to, you know, have a couple of more things, but I'll definitely let the other students talk. Yes, jump in everyone else. and. and Okay, so I'll jump in on this. I know we talked a lot about how it's important that we continue to like kind of use our voice to speak up, challenge the status quo, and to continue to uplift our community. I think what really resonated me with me was the idea that for some, like, it may feel like we might be going against our nature, like it might be hard to kind of um, speak up sometimes. But I think like what Jackie said earlier, um, taking small steps, whether that be supporting organizations like Voices, joining more on conversations like these, um, having more experience to be able to take more action. And I think like as someone who kind of also struggles with this sometimes, especially when it comes to building the confidence, um, that was one message that really resonated with me. And I feel like as long as we are always like continuing to improve ourselves, um, challenge ourselves, take small action steps, um, we can become a better version of ourselves. Um, someone who can be more confident to speak up, take action, become a leader. So. Man, but, but you guys picked up a lot, man. This is great. It was a good panel, so. Aria, Mia, Rendra. Yeah, um, oh, go ahead. Okay, I, I was just gonna say like, one thing that stuck out to me was some, uh, what John said was investing in yourself. Um, I think I come from a culture where like, you know, talking about my accomplishments or where I come from is not really encouraged or like is looked down upon in certain ways. And like just being here in the US and just like exploring myself and coming to a new country altogether, which is so far away from home, I think, I undermined my struggle, my story, and my, like, I didn't acknowledge what I went through or, like, my strengths, and I think uh, just seeing it as an investment um, and seeing, like, even what John said, like, just, you know, taking jobs that would help him grow um, and not just, like, taking on opportunities because, you know, that's what in trend or like you know or it pays more or something um I think I can say that I'm fortunate enough to pursue something that I want to you know um just focus on my growth and not just money uh, worry about other things uh but I think just learning from you know everybody in the panel and just like knowing that what I have is just unique to me and not undermining myself and not self-rejecting myself is so so important and I've done that for a long time but I think this panel was just like um like I would just say like a opening door opening for me uh just to like you know practice it in my everyday life and not just keep it hidden somewhere mm, excellent 
Mia and Ariane? Yeah, I just wanted to add on that I really enjoyed this panel and I feel that it really gave a powerful perspective, but I really liked when uh, Ms. Soon-Mi Kim uh, reframed it. And I know this is um, a question that's gonna come in the end, but when she said, people who come behind me shouldn't have to endure because I wasn't able to speak up, just really struck a powerful chord with me because it makes me really realize that even if I can't do it for myself, I should be able to do it for the people that I love and the people and the community that I love at that, at being able to go and speak up and share my stories and just represent my community because I want to open doors for my nieces and my nephews and my friends and my um, the people on this island of Guam to be able to do the same in the future if they chose to do it as well. Yeah, those are all such really great points. Uh, this panel has just been so amazing to learn from everybody that's been here. But, you know, growing up in a really small town, I was the only Asian in my entire grade. I was like the only Asian in my entire high school, and I was always different. And so hearing um, Miss J. Requero talk about just being different adds so much value to the conversation. I mean, it's just that really struck home with me because it took me so long to accept that I would be different. And even us as individuals here, even though we're all Asians and Pacific Islanders or Native Hawaiian, we all are so different and unique in our own ways. And really seeing the value and having your own perspective was something that just was really amazing to hear about. Great, Ian. So, you know, I'm gonna let you uh, ask a question here. You, you volunteered, anybody wanna ask a question? So go ahead, you get the yeah. next question. Um, I think I'll also kind of go off script, um, but I think, <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's something relative to the, the question is that like, we're really talking about diversity and representation. And I think the people who are staying here to really listen about our voice and what we're going to do in the industry really want to know like what's different about us right and i think it's all about the diversity that we're seeing in our classes with our professors and in the media and so i would ask how has that affected the way that you're going about your community about your career and just your career in general who would like to go first <laughs> okay i'll go first <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay um, so I think what's really interesting, this especially is called, being- This is called creating power, by the way, by taking <laughs> over, so. Um, so, you know, the whole thing about being a Gen Z is that like we have access to technology at a very young age. Um, and I think what's so cool about it is that like, I personally haven't felt as if like, I have, I'm not like tied to the Asian community. I always feel like there's access to it because of social media, right? Like if I feel like, oh my gosh, I don't see a lot of Filipinos or like a lot of Filipino culture, I can just pull up my phone, scroll on TikTok and like in the fourth scroll with some Filipino guy like do like talking about like adobo or tinikling or like, you know, whatever it might be. So I think it's like, it's a little bit challenging and it's a little bit different the way that I'm approaching my career knowing that like I have so many people to access just by opening my phone, op going on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and accessing that community. And I think what will be really interesting is how we're gonna utilize that once we go into like mid-level, senior level into our careers. So that's my two cents. I know Aria has something to say about this, don't you, Aria? I love how you call me out, <laughs> but I, <laughs> um, no, I really, I agree with that. And I just think, you know, in the panels, they brought up, you know, we need to give them mentors, we need to give them outlets, and just having this access to um, business-like or formalized outlets like LinkedIn just makes it easier to communicate and find those, um, those people because it gives us this kind of platform where I don't need to meet them face-to-face, -face, which is a bit more intimidating, but I can just send a message instead to make me feel a little bit secure about myself to reach out and... Um, and not only that, but also just to have a background about people beforehand and just to do that research and having that power to also of social media to just share your voice without actually for them to see your face and to see and to make, and it kind of just takes away that veil of intimidation because you're behind a screen, which is a double-edged sword. Of course, we all know, right? It's a double-edged sword, but it's also an opportunity and an advantage towards us. And um, I feel that, you know, I'm excited to see how Gen Z and other millennials will use this power 
and this opportunity to grow as community as um, Ian um, expressed too. Oh my God, the OG in me is like a little dander is going up in my head. Oh my God, uh, LinkedIn, I, I get it. LinkedIn, TikTok, all these things are amazing platforms for you to engage. But what about being in person? What happens when you meet these LinkedIn people and these TikTok people in person? Um, how do you engage them? So it's one thing be, being behind a screen and being able to like stalk people and uh, on LinkedIn, which I'm really good at doing, by the way. But what happens uh, when you meet people, Zini and Mia and Rinda? Um, uh, how do you build those skill sets so that uh, you know once uh, the 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 ana uh, anonymity of being in front of a computer is gone and you have to face somebody face to face, which is going to happen sometime? Uh, how do you navigate that? Um, I think like just adding on to what you said, Bill, and just like Ian and Arya said that um, social media and like technology has like, in my opinion, exposed me to perspectives that I don't really necessarily agree with. And that has also led me to find what perspectives I agree with in a way and just help me like lead my story and kind of find my journey. And that has inspired me to uh, stand up with things uh, that I do believe in. And when I do any kind of work or I look for opportunities, I know what I'm kind of looking for because that's the value mm -hmm. I want to add to, you know, wherever I would be working for or whoever I would be working with. And I saw this video somewhere and that said that, you know, it's one thing to give somebody a seat at a table, but it's another to give them a voice. And I think that really stuck with me. And just like, like you said, just meeting people through like different events, like, uh, you know, at the Planck Center Gala or like any other panel, it's just like, you know, I feel like I take that opportunity as my voice uh, being out there and just, you know, have taking that opportunity to kind of own who I am and just navigate through the perspectives I found or like developed behind a screen and finally testing them out in real life and it necessarily not has to be right at the time or like I might sense I might say something that I know I might not agree with like two years later but I think it's just like that journey of being out there and just learning and unlearning things um, and just like finding their voice I think that is something I really take pride in as a millennium slash gen z um and i think like our generation is really lucky to kind of have that kind of access to so many perspectives um and just like making good use of it really good point aria and really good point Rindra. excellent points uh, mia or, or zini do you want to weigh in on this or or should we move on I'll weigh in on it. Um, I thought I think it was really interesting hearing everyone's perspectives on it, but I, I definitely agree with what everyone's been saying. Having social media like TikTok and Instagram and LinkedIn definitely gives me access to a lot of perspectives. And so answering your question of what do I do when I have to go in person? Well, it's just, you know, it's gathering where I land on all those perspectives and then sticking to myself and, you know, pursuing that journey of lifelong learning of being like Farinda said, being willing to unlearn and learn again and that whole process. But at the time, just accepting who I am and presenting that. And if, if they don't like it, then that's okay. They don't have to, but at the time I like it. And that's what sits well with me. <laughs> Before Ian's dying to ask the last question because we're gonna have to wrap up pretty soon, but I do have a question. How many of you want to work in an agency um, any of you want to work in an agency or currently are pursuing a job in a public relations agency or marketing agency? Okay, and, and uh, how many of you would rather work for a corporation, large or small? Or how many of you want to be in business for yourself? Mm, okay, watch out PR folks. Uh, the future agency people or the future people that are going to be running companies are right here. So. Interesting. Um, Ian, did you uh, or anybody from the audience want to ask a question? Please feel free. I know Ian would like to ask another question. Thanks, Bill. Um, so I know we're almost at time, so I'd like to wrap it up with our question, but feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Um, but for all our panelists here, how important is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month to each of you, as well as 
Um, what gives you pride in being Asian, Asian American, or Pacific Islander? Who would like to start? Um, I, I would like to start. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in truth, I don't really like celebrate Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, but I think that this month is still really important to kind of like dedicate to our community still to celebrate those that have come before us and to let everyone know that we are also significant and important to the shaping of America and to which many people might have taken for granted if not talked or celebrated about. And I think it's also important that like beyond just the month of May in the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month that our community is recognized as well. Um, but as for being like Asian, there is a lot of things that I think make me proud to be Asian American. Like as a Chinese American, I take pride in like the food, the rich culture, um, the many traditions we have on holidays, such as uh, Lunar New Year, whether that be exchanging red envelopes or having a big dinner with like, the family during um, Lunar, like the New Year Eve. And these are all things that make me proud to be Asian. And um, apart from those, one of the biggest things I think that I also take pride in is like the values that my parents have shared share with me. Um, values such as family respect, responsibility, and especially work ethic, which I think has also shaped like who I am today. And I really do take pride in these type of um, values. Anybody else? Looks like, uh, yeah, Aria. Definitely just wanna, add on though I, I think it's a really important part to to really appreciate that we do have a dedicated month but to make sure that we utilize these perspectives and all these lessons that we're learning right now throughout the year and really express our heritage and our voices year round just not just this month like we continue these conversations next month and the month after that because um, that's how we really grow and move as a community towards where we want to be. And I also feel that what gives me pride, as I've stated before, is that we're on this panel and we have this power and ability to actually effectively make this change that we want to see. And even though that it's not going to happen in, you know, the baby boomer generation or the Gen X generation, and maybe it won't even happen with our generation Z, but we have the ability to move a step further for the generation behind us. And that's what really matters. And I feel that that's the pride that I have as an Asian Pacific Islander within this community is being able to be a part of that power. Woo, jeez. Mia, do you wanna jump in? Sure, I mean, just adding on really, these two girls summed it up really well, but I definitely feel like this month is so important because it's a time for us to share. You know, this whole panel, we've been talking about sharing our stories and one of the things that definitely makes me very, you know, take pride in our culture is definitely our food. I'm gonna say it, I think we have some of the best food out there and, but it's so much more than just our food. There's this culture around our food of sharing it and sharing it with others, both within our culture and outside of it. And I think that just really ties it all together of sharing our stories. You can share it over a meal and really just introduce everybody to our culture and who we are. And there's such a huge diversity within our culture. And I think it's highlighted so well through our food. That's great. Um, I, I think we have to wrap it up, but but I, I this is kind of a really quick answer. So maybe one or one one or two words because somebody did ask, is there something from the public relations people in the audience that you would like to learn about? You know, maybe one or two words. Brenda, what's one or two what's one thing that you would like to learn from people that are currently in the business? Uh, and maybe just one word or a sentence because um, we have one minute to finish. I think what I would uh, want to learn is like, I, I don't know how to, to say it in a word, uh, like in a sentence, but I was like, how do you um, be different? Like sometimes it's just easy to say and like, or be different on yourself, but how do you actually do that and implement it every day? Um, that's something I would ask, um, mm. learn from, yeah. How to be different, okay. Aria, Amy, Ian, one one sentence. Give it to me. Probably say um, how, like. Okay, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you got it. You got it. I was just gonna say um, how to continuously have authentic connections with people. Woo. Very good. Okay, Ian. I would say one like, sentence. Oh, 
how to make more money is a good one. Um, and like, let's, let's just be real, right? I think it's because like, like what Jackie had mentioned, like young talent entering the communications PR industry are like not making a lot of money, especially like when you're comparing us to like tech folks. So I would say- More money, okay. <laughs> you're busting some stereotypes here. All right. <laughs> I guess like how to continue improving oneself to like grow. Oh, keep improving. Okay, that's a good one. Mia, you get the last one. Oh boy. Um, I would probably just say, how do you bring, you know, your culture into your everyday life and make those connections with people and, and bring your true, like Aria said, bring your true and authentic self to your job. Well, thank you. Those are all great. So hopefully the people in the audience took some notes here. I just want to say thank you to everyone that uh, is on this panel uh, and all the students here. You're probably all looking for jobs. So I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are hiring. So uh, please uh, keep in touch with these students. Uh, they are the future of our industry. And so we're really excited to have them. I'm gonna call Patrice Tanaka up on the stage here, who's going to offer some parting remarks. And, if and then we're gonna invite the panelists all back to kind of answer any questions that the audience may have that we did not cover. So Patrice uh, and students, uh, we'll call you back shortly. All right, thanks, Bill. Oh my goodness, there is a wealth of riches shared uh, this evening by everyone. Um, but there was a, a common theme uh, and the story of AANHPI sharing their stories. And I know there's a lot of trepidation about sharing our stories, but actually it's an act of generosity to share yourself with other people um, and not have them ask you 21 questions to even to get a sense of who you are. So I see it as an act of generosity to proactively share who you are. Because as has been said by a number of people, if you take yourself out of the equation and stop focusing on your own fear about speaking and think about what you're doing is honoring those who came before you, it is you know, your homage to the people who made all the sacrifices so you could be here in this country uh, chasing the American dream. So I think the whole idea of um, telling your story and, and um, I think we started the conversation with Richard saying, that you should spend a lot of time discovering who you are, where you came from, where your parents came from, why your parents made the decisions that they did. And writing it down is so empowering. And I love that Bei Ling said, we read to understand others. We write to better understand ourselves. And I know all of us who have done writing about personal, uh, about personal stories, we learn about ourselves in the process. So I think that's a really great exercise to engage in. And it also makes sharing the stories that you um, have written about yourself easier to tell. <clears throat> I, someone else said, um, sometimes it's painful to share these stories because the shame that our stories are too Asian once again, if we think about, you know, not the shame that our stories are so different, but my, my God, it's so wonderful that our ancestors, my, our grandfathers, our grandparents came to this country, not even speaking the language many times, and tried to make a new life, uh, not so much for themselves, but for generations to come, for for all of us, for all of you. And I think Jackie said, uh, small steps lead to greater confidence to share and even speak up in a meeting. Once you start sharing, just taking baby steps to do say one thing in every meeting, it gets easier. And John also, I love this. Um, John and Sun Mi said two very powerful things that communications people have to be more visible and active. And what we can do is to help um, AANHPI nonprofits 
to be more effective in communicating their messages because oftentimes, you know, if English is not their first language, it's very difficult for them to craft a very succinct and cogent and compelling message. But that this is our training. We can we can help these nonprofits. And if each one of us volunteered to help one AANHPI nonprofit, we could be supporting so much of our community. Okay. Um, Sunmi said, um, claim your power. And we shouldn't be afraid of the, the P word. I know sometimes uh, we shy away from, I'm not a, a power hungry uh, person, but if you look at it in terms of power is the ability to achieve purpose and affect change, well then you want power so you can uh, affect the change that you seek to make in the world, right? And Jackie said, be generous with your time and, and, and energy. I think generosity is such an important um, uh, dimension of why people want to be uh, a friend, why they want to engage with you. Um, Jay said, um, being different is adding value to the conversation. Yes, that is so great. Um, there's, we shouldn't um, be afraid of being different. We, we shouldn't want to be like everyone else because who needs a world with 7.9 billion people who are all the same, right? It's in our differences that uh, the richness lies. And be curious, ask questions. Don't wait for people to ask you questions, ask questions. That's the easiest way to get around any kind of nervousness because people are usually willing to answer if you are interested enough to ask questions, okay? You also have to be clear and direct about asking for what you want. Sometimes we, Asians can be very indirect, non-direct, but I actually think that being direct is the most efficient way to accomplish what's most important. And it's certainly the language of business. And it, even in business, people find it hard to be direct, but I think being direct is, is, is the kindest and, and most gentle way that you can be with someone. And also, yes, Jay also mentioned the, um, the saying that we have a responsibility to lift as we climb. That is so true because it's not just about um, achieving success just for ourselves. It's about helping others to achieve success so that together we can all be successful. And if each of us helps other people, not just within the AANHPI community, but across the board, um, uh, that's a good thing. We need to reach out and, um, and lend a helping hand. Somebody talked about, um, everyone has talked about the importance of having mentors. And I say that, you know, you shouldn't be shy to reach out to someone and just ask them to give you a 10 minute mentoring moment. I had one of my mentees, a woman named Sabrina Brown, and everybody knows Sabrina these days. Um, five years ago, when I was receiving the Paladin Award at, by the PRSA Foundation, she and her colleague from BCW uh, Global came up to me and, and asked me, could, could I do a mentoring moment uh, with them? I said, you mean now at, at this reception? She said, yes, just for 10 minutes. I said, oh, okay. So we sat down at one of the little cocktail tables and I kind of rattled off some things. And of course it went for more than 10 minutes, but that started kind of a, 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 a much longer term relationship. Um, so yeah, yes, we're in each other's lives quite a bit. And, and I've involved her in uh, one of my, um, uh, favorite nonprofits, Girl Scouts of Greater New York, because we're all about leadership development for girls and women, because God knows we need more women at every leadership table. So Sabrina, of course, has enlisted her posse. And so now there's a group of them involved in um, the Girl Scouts of Greater New York. And we need leaders, young leaders like Sabrina Brown. Here's the other thing that I say, I'm obviously an, an Asian American, 
when I look at all of my mentees, a lot of my mentees are not necessarily AANHPI. And I and purposely so, because I don't want people thinking that I'm only interested in mentoring people of my own community. I'm interested in mentoring um, young people from every community, especially diverse communities. So anyone who pretty much reaches out to me, I'm going to spend some time to talk to them. And I think that most adults who, who understand that, you know, at a certain point in your career, it's about giving, giving back, right, and, and helping others along their way. So you should never feel shy about just reaching out to people that you meet on LinkedIn or even live and in person. That's even better. And I know that's even more intimidating, but sometimes that can be more powerful. You can't have every relationship be just via social media. And you're talking to somebody who is like the social media queen. I know my friends laugh at me because I'm so engaged uh, on social media, pretty much every platform. And that's because I'm a communicator. I can't help. I want to I wanna talk stories and I want to share with as many people that are interested in the things that, that I'm interested in. Aria said, she said, we have the ability to move a step further forward to make the change we want to see in the world. And that is such a powerful statement. Change may not happen overnight, maybe not in my lifetime, maybe not in yours, but we are all moving the, uh, the, the ball forward to create the big, bright future that we all want to live in, or we want our children and grandchildren to live in. All right, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Don't Patrice, ask me to that was sum great. Up this time. <laughs> uh, we're actually gonna have to wrap up, but I do want all the panelists to come back and so we can have a little photo op. Uh, but if there is one burning question out there that somebody would like to ask, you know, please feel free to ask uh, our combined panel here. And, and for all of you who stayed on for the last two hours, thank you so much. Uh, but we, we, we do wanna acknowledge all of our panelists. And if there is that burning question out there, uh, we will be happy to uh, answer that question now. Otherwise, we're going to wrap up with a, a photo. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for staying on. Thank you to the Museum of Public Relations, Shelley, Barry, all of our sponsors, and to all of our panelists. And make sure you hashtag Museum of PR if you post this on socials. And yeah. thank you, everyone, so much. Thank and thank you, you Shelley. And all of you for being here tonight uh, in thank celebration you, of Bill. Asian, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Yes, and thank, thank you, you Bill. Yes. Great job, Bill. All Great right, job. good night, everyone. Good night. good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everybody. Buy me a boba if you're in LA. Oh.